that was a good story. I'm old, so it's been like 20 years. Uh, it was the winter in Boston, 1981. The snow was a meter high. I was feeling really fed up, and I just came across a little note at this at MIT in Boston. And I came across a little note. Um, Eric Drexler, telephone contact to California, the MIT uh, Nanotech Club. Oh, that'd be interesting, so I went along there. And it was uh, uh, Eric Drexler, one of, the, one of the fathers of Nanotech. He gave his talk, and then it was question time, and I stood up and said, uh, Eric, how about a femtotech? And I was really surprised by his answer. He poo pooed the idea. He thought it was ridiculous. So I said, well, wait a minute, aren't you doing just the same thing that your critics, critics are saying about you and your ideas on nanotech? But he, he didn't buy it. Anyway, so on and off, I've been thinking about uh, the possibility of a, of a femtotech. It wasn't until I eventually retired and we start thinking hard about it and then enough time to study enough particle physics to be able to do it. So I've made some progress that you'll, you'll see today. So um, about a uh, femto, that means 10 to minus 15, so 1,000 for the trillion of a meter. So if a femtometer technology could be made, it would outperform nanotech, which is uh, 10 to the minus 9 of a meter, so a million times smaller. So the density of your components would be a million times a million times a million. So the density goes up by a factor of a million cubed. Okay? And each little component is a million times closer together. So the signaling speed between them would be a million times faster. So you've got a million cubed times more components per unit volume. And the signaling speed of each one, the operating speed of each one, is a million times faster. So the total performance of that Pepto gadget would outperform nanotech by a factor of a million to a power of four. That's a trillion trillion. Okay. Now in this talk, I'll also give you a little atto tech. Atto, A-T-T-O, that's a thousand times smaller than Pepto. And, uh, and right now my pet project is, uh, I'm thinking about string tech. Okay. Go right down to the smallest uh, measurement scale that humanity has even thought of, and that's the so-called Planck scale. And that's 10 to the minus 35 of a meter. So, and that really got me thinking, is if, if our future massively intelligent machines are smart enough to be able to implement these technologies, then uh, a so-called femto effect, that's a femtometer scale after that, that's artificial intellect, would uh, I'll perform a, a nano effect, it's a nano scale artifact, but a factor of trillion trillion. So you, you can see there would be pressure after a while to just scale down and down. Because the smaller, the faster. Okay. So you can just do more. So that really got me thinking, thinking, well, you know, our universe is what you were saying earlier today. 7.7 .7 billion years old, our solar system is 4.6 billion years old, with a trillion trillion stars out there. And a similar number are second or third generation stars. Also, the physics is the same everywhere. So, yeah. you probably heard of Fermi's question. Fermi said, well, if, if the highly intelligent creatures are commonplace in the universe, and he has this famous question, where are they? <coughs> why, why do we have no. Why isn't there sort of like. McDonald's in the sky. Why isn't there obvious evidence of massive engineering projects that, that are obvious? We just sort of look up and, and see them. We don't, we don't see them. And I think, and this is the hypothesis, I think the answer is that in a sense, massive, hypermassive intelligence is potentially everywhere. But it's so tiny, we can't see it. So if you have a technology based on quarks and on the kind of uh, electrons, and they're the two basic ingredients of everything, you know, all substance. Well, unless you start counting dark matter and dark energy, but the stuff we know about. They're effectively point particles, right? They have, they have no size. Unless you go with string theory, but then you have to go by the dark matter. So the potential of putting these components together is just this for a moment, which, which again reinforces uh, I'm thinking that um, the, the potential of these massively intelligent machines is 
far-greater than the conventional thinking at, at nanoscale. But even nanoscale would outperform what our brains do at a fact of a trillion trillion. So, so what I'm saying is there's enormous scope. Okay, so I'll give you some, uh, a taste of how uh, at least computing at the femto level might be done. So nanotech's well funded, so what's next? Well, it can't be picotech. That's a thousand times smaller than nano. Because there's just nothing there. Nature does not provide anything at that scale. Okay? Like the atom is what, 10 to the minus 10 of a meter? So what's smaller than an atom? Well, the nucleus. That's a hundred thousand times small. That's 10 to the minus 15. So you, you go from that, you have to go from nano to, to femto. And uh, the nucleus is about you know, 2 to minus 15, so the protons and neutrons inside the nucleus are you know, more or less the same scale. And inside the, the nucleons, protons and neutrons, are three quarks. So uh, if you're going to start thinking about a possible femtotech, at least you know, computing, you need to know the properties of the, the quarks and gluons. The quark, the, what's a gluon? A gluon is sort of like a photon, but it uh, binds, just from the name, in a sense, glues, bonds the quarks together to make a proton or a neutron. Now, to study all that, if you like math and physics, because it's not easy, uh, there's a specialist branch of physics called QCD, quantum chromodynamics. And that C, the chromo, might give you some clues. It uh, stands for color. And what's color? Well, it's a kind of charge. And the quarks have ordinary charge that you're used to, electronic positive and negative charge. But they have another kind of charge, uh, which comes in three kinds. Um, that's why it's called color. But it, it has nothing to do, remember this, it has nothing to do with the, the ordinary color that we're used to at our scale. I mean, they're just labels. I mean, you call them blim, blam, and bloom, or ABC, or XYZ. Three um, labels, like just red, blue, and green. So it comes in three kinds of colors. Well, actually six, because there's also anti-red, and anti-green, and anti-blue. Uh, the, quarks, the quarks have these three different colors. You have a red quark, a blue quark, a green quark. Remember, it's not real colors, they're just, they're just labels, they're just abstract properties. And the gluons that bind the quarks, uh, they, they, they are bicolored. They, they have uh, two, two colors each. So, for example, you can have a red and an anti-blue. Or you have a blue and an anti-red, and uh, remember that because that become critical for the computing. I'll use those um, blue ones to change the colors on the quarks, and, and hence the, the computing. Okay, so set that correct. Now uh, these colors, red, blue, green, when you have an interaction, those colors are conserved. Like you sum them all up, and what you start with is what you get towards the end. So have, have a bottom here. Yes, here, here you have a, an interaction. So you get a red quark, and it emits uh, a gluon. And so Q for quark and G for gluon. Yeah. Now have a look. You see on the left hand side you've got a red, so you've got a charge, a color charge red. And on the right hand side you've got a blue and a red and an anti-blue. Now the, the X and the anti-X cancel. Right? So the blue and anti-blue cancel, so you're left with a red. So uh, you have red on the left side, red on the right side. So, so color charge is conserved and it's kept, it's constant. And if it doesn't happen, that interaction is not possible from the right. Okay. Now a quark can not only emit a blue one, but also an absorb one. So in the middle of the screen, you've got an example here of uh, an absorption uh, of a blue one uh, by, by a red quark. So you see there the anti-red and the red, they cancel, and all you're left is blue. So what you've got there is uh, by absorbing a quark, uh, sorry, a blue one, the quark changes its color. Now, for those of you, the computer guys amongst you, you're beginning to sense the possibility you might be able to compute with, with these kinds of phenomena. Right, so how, how to do that? What are the basic ideas? Well, let's use the red quark and the blue quark, the colors, to represent bits. Okay, so we'll just make a definition. Red, a red quark, by definition, is a one, as, as in binary digit bits. And a blue quark, blue is zero. 
Okay, so if you want to change a 1 to a 0, well, you change the red quark to a blue quark. If you want to change a 0 to a 1, well, you change the blue quark to a red quark. Okay, just basic bits. So how, how do you do that? Well, if you have a computer science background, you'll know <coughs> that these three logic gates uh, in combination, you can do anything with them. You, you can compute. You can build a computer with these, these three logic gates, even less computer sample. So the so-called all gate, and gate, and uh, not gate. So not, you just, if, if you have a one in, the not gate will switch it to a zero. Zero goes in, will switch it to a, a one. An OR gate, if, if just one of your inputs is a 1, the output is 1. And for an AND gate, uh, you have to have input A AND input B to be a 1. Both of them have to be a 1 for the output to be a 1. All other cases are 0. So if I can map phenomena that's going on at the quark level, quark and gluons, if I can map that into uh, these three logic gates, um, it's bigger, it's a lot of engineering type problems, but in principle, if I can do that, then I can compute at the femto scale. So you can have femto computers. So you can have artificial minds at the femto scale and at the atto scale. And uh, hopefully maybe at uh, the conference six months from now, I'll be giving a talk on Planck. <laughs> Planck creatures and mind boggles. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so with those three gates, you can compute anything, right? Computationally universal. All right. Now, um, before we get into the nitty gritty, I'm going to do the time. Move like five more minutes. Okay. So, um, <laughs> how do you implement an um, all gate? Uh, sorry, not gate. Well, have a little chamber, a little volume, and you send in from the left-hand side uh, a red quark here, and inside this chain, this little volume, tiny, it might be the size of a proton or something, but that kind of volume, uh, put red and blue uh, gluons, well, specifically red anti-blue or uh, blue anti-red. So if a red one comes in, it gets changed to a blue. Okay? The gluons change the color of the quark. And if a blue goes in, the gluons change it to a red. So you've, that's a, that's a, a not get. Okay? Now, given the time, uh, I'll just give a few examples. I don't have enough time. Now, uh, to do to implement an OR gate, remember, uh, if one of them is a one, uh, the output is a one. So uh, the, you have these two chambers with two little volumes. And the left hand side here, if uh, if a red quark comes in, then uh, a blue one is generated. It's created. Uh, red minus uh, red anti blue uh, blue one is generated, which enters then the second chamber, second little volume, uh, as well as the second bit that comes in. Well, say they're both red, so the first bit and the second bit are red. So when the first bit goes in, that generates the blue one, which goes into the second chamber, and a second red quark goes in, and uh, the blue one has no effect on it because otherwise the charge is not conserved. So the second red blue one just goes straight through. So the outcome is a red, a red blue one. Okay? So two reds in, you get a red out. Now second case, uh, you've got a red in and then a, a blue, a blue quark goes in. Now the, uh, the blue one that comes out of the first one, that will change the color of the second red into a blue, uh, sorry. So into a, into, change the blue into a red. So you've got two, you've got a red going in and a red will come out. So red, blue, or one zero gives you red, which is one. So one zero gives you one. The third one, just quickly. So now you've got a blue and a blue. Blue and a red, sorry. Uh, now if a blue goes in, the first one, nothing comes out. No blue one comes out. And you've got a red going into the second one, and, and no blue ones there, so the red will just go through unchanged. So you still get a red coming out. Okay? So 0, 1 gives you 1. Now, when uh, they're all blues, um, no blue one comes out from the first one. Uh, the blue second one goes in. There's, there's no blue ones to change it, so it just goes through unchanged. So it comes out blue. So 0, zero, zero gives you 0. Okay? So you've got the all gate, 
implemented in uh, in quarks and gluons. Now, I don't have the time to give you all the end, but it's a bit more complicated. There are like three chambers used, and uh, then the, these PowerPoints, will they, be on the, will they be on the website? Will all the PowerPoints, um, if you want to study it, you can... Yeah, sure. Okay. Also, it's, it's an essay in... <laughs> <laughs> it's an essay in uh, Humanity Plus essays, you can, if, if you want to go into the details. Now, uh, there's, there's also Atotech, so we can go down another factor of uh, a thousand times smaller. And uh, instead of using gluons, you're using uh, weak force particles. Remember, there are four forces in, in nature strong nuclear, electromagnetic, weak nuclear, and gravitational. So, uh, if you use the weak particle forces, W plus and W minus, you're not changing the color of the gluon. You're changing its flavor, in other words, its type. Now, there's six types of, of quarks. There's up, down, strange, uh, charmed, and top and bottom. Right? There's six, six type of quarks, kind of those famous standard model. Now, the weak particles can change the flavor. They can change the type. So you can, you can change uh, like an up quark into a down quark or a down quark into an up quark. And then the same logic goes through. Right? Just, just all those chains I was talking about. You're doing just the same thing. It's the same logic, but it's a thousand times smaller. So you have the basis of an atotech. This is all with known physics. Right? 10 to the minus 18 of a meter. OK, now I'll skip a little bit. Get to the, the philosophy. So. Uh, yeah, with all these techs, uh, microtech, nanotech, uh, there's a company, company of picotech, a femtotech, a natotech, a zeptotech, zeptotech, yamtotech, yoktotech, plank tech, right? Under 10 minus 35. So that has implications, right? So I think I see here, you know, I see here an answer one of them, to uh, Fermi's famous question. Like if, if you start, it's like a real paradigm shifting in your thinking, the way of looking at the world. If, it's a big if, but if massive intelligence is everywhere, like why are all the electrons the same? As though they all came out of the same production line. Why, why is that? <clears throat> Couldn't because they're manufactured? Like if you start seeing intelligence in the elementary particles, it makes you sort of more inclined to deism, isn't it? It's only just being dumb, inert, useless gizmos. They may actually there may be whole civilizations at that at X tech scale inside elementary particles. So instead of talking about instead of looking for for SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence out there. How about looking for SIPI, search for intra-particle intelligence, right here inside? Because that's maybe where the real intelligence is. Yeah.